Welcome to our 58th episode of AAA weekly webinar series. Anil Goel and Ankit Goel, they will deliberate today on the very, very recent two Supreme Court judgments where the some of the much awaited concepts are clarified. One is in the case of Apu Hotels and the other is in the case of Amtec Auto. So Ankit, this is, these are actually very important two judgments and our team has done a wonderful job and has also correlated this judgment with the SR Steel judgment and earlier judgments of Phoenix ARC Spade Financial Services. So today also like, uh, I thought it is very important that I should maintain the continuity, although I am traveling to Mumbai and then certainly it has become a habit to do a webinar at 11 a.m. on every Saturday. So I'll just share my screen, Ankit. Yes, let's go ahead. So let's understand. Go through these two judgments. Okay. Uh, Participants, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, here on the uh, judgments. Uh, like in case we see, uh, these are the recent judgments. One is passed on 3rd of May 2023, and the other is on 4th of May 2023. These uh, uh, judgments are this is MK Raja Gopalan versus Dr. Priya Sami Palani Gounder, and this is in the case of uh, Appu Hotels. And the other is the Vistra ITCL Limited. Vistra ITCL Limited is a, uh, a trustee, uh, security trustee versus Dinkar uh, Venkata Subramanian, who is a resolution professional. And this is case of MTech Auto. So first we will take up this case of Appu Hotel, which is the titled as MK Raja Gopalan versus Piriya Sami Palani. Now in this case, in, in this particular case, and there are uh, multiple parties, like in case we see the uh, MK Raja Gopalan is a resolution applicant and Mr. Radha Krishnan is a resolution professional. And then there are promoters like uh, uh, Piriya Sami Palani is a promoter and Dharani Finance Limited is a related party financial creditor. Now, when we say a related party financial creditor, so these are the various issues because this is Dharani Finance Limited has also submitted their claim as related parties, as operational creditor and financial creditors. And the like in case we see the facts of this case, it was a case which was uh, admitted on in May 20. And then the resolution plan was also approved uh, in January 21. I mean, if you see this particular case from May to uh, January, actually the resolution plan was approved in almost uh, eight, 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 nine, eight, nine months. That's really wonderful. In eight months, the resolution plan was approved in this case. And the uh, COC recommended some changes in the resolution plan. And the changed resolution plan was submitted to NCLT without getting it approved from Committee of Creditors. This was one issue where a lot of, uh, uh, in fact, uh, where a lot of uh, litigation started. So these were the issues which was, there were various issues which were raised by financial creditors and the resolution applicant. So NCLT dismissed all the objections and approved the resolution plan. And several appeals were filed before appellate authority and GLAT. And the appellate authority also gave an order in January 22. So in case you see January 21, the resolution plan was approved. And after the approval, uh, it was approved by, in January 22, it was, uh, approved by uh, uh, the COC and then it was approved by NCLT also and finally the NCLAT order also came within a year. So that means NCLT passed the resolution plan and also appeal was also finalized. So this was something which was, uh, uh, it was good. And so in that case, the various objections were upheld by NCLAT and the, uh, the, the, like the, appellate tribunal somehow said that the related party 
claim should not be discriminated. Related party claims should not be dis discriminated from that of unrelated parties. So basically, the claim of Dharani finance, that should also be admitted in the resolution plan and they should also be distributed some uh, proceeds. So the, uh, the uh, Dharani finance, in fact, they had two claims, 1.94 crore and the 4.81 crore. 4.81 crore was a financial creditor claim and they were, they were actually finding total common relief that they should not be treated as a related party and also they should not be discriminated in the resolution plan as far as the distribution of proceeds are concerned. The adjudicating authority dismissed their application and allowed the resolution plan. And finally, the, the adjudicating authority examined the questions very well. And finally, adjudicating authority said, what is like the, the uh, NCLT, in fact, relied on the Committee of Creditors of SR Steel Limited uh, versus Sish Kumar Gupta and rejected their contentions that there is no provision in the code. There is no provision in the code which requires mandatory payment to the related party creditors. And there is no provision which says that there should be equality between the related party and unrelated party. So this, this was the observation and therefore uh, the, it was also held very clearly that the distribution of the proceeds of the resolution plan is the domain of the resolution applicant. And then it is the commercial wisdom of committee of creditors. So therefore the security value, security interest, it may be considered because section 30 subsection two uh, subsection four says the value of the security may be considered, but it doesn't say that it shall be considered. So therefore, it is also said like in the same judgment, it is also said, however, the allocation of the proceeds of the resolution plan should be done in such a manner that nobody should prefer liquidation over resolution. So in case more people will prefer liquidation over resolution, then in that case means their security value is not being paid. So in case we pay their security value, then they will not prefer liquidation and they will prefer resolution. So this was the discussion of the uh, adjudicating authority. And in this SR steel regarding the principle of equality, that was also considered like equality is not something that has been provided in the code irrespective of their security interest or status as operational or financial creditor should get equal payment. This was not a kind of the, the IBC doesn't say that. So within a class of creditors of the financial creditor, different treatment based on creditor security value is, is permissible. So this is what was the uh, relying on this, this case of uh, Satish Kumar Gupta in the case of SR Steel. So this is now finally, it had actually gone to uh, the Supreme Court and the, the Supreme Court has already said that the, uh, the supremacy of the COC and the, even the supremacy of the COC was upheld by the Honorable Supreme Court. It also said that there should not be an inherent conflict of interest between the lenders. Therefore, the, Allocation should be in such a manner that more and more people, they should try to vote for the resolution plan and not for the, uh, and, and not for the liquidation. Then uh, the uh, like decision, uh, whatever decision that we saw, that was, it was basically the um, appellate tribunal. Uh, the, there were appeals filed by different, different parties. Now the appellate tribunal reversed the order for adjudicating authority and rejected the resolution plan and remanded the matter back to the COC. And in fact, it was guide, it was directed by NCLAT that a fresh form G may be published, fresh expression of interest may be released, and fresh resolution plans may be invited from public at large. So as regards the question of discrimination between the claims of the related parties, 
the appellate tribunal by placing reliance on the decision in the case of Phoenix ARC Private Limited versus Paid Financial Services Limited. They observed that the related party was specifically treated as a class unto itself and was restricted from any involvement in the CIRP in any capacity and disqualified from being a resolution applicant. That was what was held in Phoenix ARC. The underlying object of this particular uh, uh, Phoenix ARC was that the involvement of related party in CIRP is actually is seen as giving unfair benefit to the corporate debtor because the related party and the corporate debtor are same. So appellate authority in fact said that the related party financial creditor or operational creditor cannot be discriminated against under the resolution plan, although they are not a party for CIRP, they are not a party who can actually vote for the resolution plan, but the allocation should not be discriminated. So IPC excludes related party from participating into the COC and in no manner disallow them from distribution. That's what was held. The final, uh, the NCLAD said that the IPC does not treat related party as a separate class. The rational nexus must exist for any classification between the object sought to achieve the classification. Related party, financial or op uh, operational, cannot be discriminated. They have, so this was finally the honorable uh, uh, said. No, in this case, like this is not relevant. Phoenix ARC is not relevant. I'm only trying to say that the, the proceedings though went to Supreme Court. Now we come to the Supreme Court total proceedings. Eight appeals were filed and one set of appeal was basically resolution applicant and the other was the uh, other was the resolution professional against the promoters and the, the and the related parties. Now, in this case, uh, various judgments were used like Phoenix ARC was discussed, Pratap Technocrats for that, Kalpara Dharmashi was discussed, Fakar Alloy was discussed. So it was actually appellant submitted that the resolution professional has admitted the certain dues of the related parties. The resolution plan did not provide for any payment. On previous occasions, this court as well as other fora had differentiated between related and non-related parties under the resolution plan that is acceptable. And even article 14 of the constitution of India equality before law was also discussed. So, it is like it was submitted that there, there was a need only to ensure that the plan provides for payment to financial creditors, including dissenting financial creditors entitled to vote. So this was the appellant saying, the respondent was saying, respondent was in this case was Dharani, the Dharani Finance, which is a related party. And the Padmanabhan, uh, uh, basically they argued that the treatment of related parties as a separate class for payment is not fair. And they are saying that the, this is a non-banking financial institution. And it was argued that they should actually get their claim. <clears throat> and now they are not being paid anything. And they are also saying that the uh, Phoenix ARC is saying <clears throat> that there is uh, laid down the reasons for treating the related party in a separate class. The rationale behind this has been achieving by not allowing related parties to present the resolution plan. That is the reason the they were considered as different, but not for the purpose of distribution. And uh, there was no reason. But finally, <clears throat> these were the questions which actually was entered. Ankit, is there any question so far or you also would like to add? Because these, now we are now coming to those questions which have been handled by the Supreme Court uh, in this uh, judgment. Uh, two important questions have, have been handled. In case you feel that there are some questions, no question so far. I think we we can uh, take up questions, uh, or rather, I can come back with questions once we move forward. But then, uh, yes, this is something which is of wide implication because uh, we know that a lot of people, uh, a lot of CDs, when they go into insolvency, uh, create some kind of a structure uh, prior to going to CIRP where they create a related party interest. Sometimes the related party interest can be also on account of purchase of any old loans that any related party has given. And that is also something that I think we've discussed before. And uh, then they have a voting share or the related parties, you know, uh, basically are part of the process then through that mechanism. 
so that is also something that we should discuss here because i think here it was very well you know in knowledge that these entities are related parties but there are scenarios where the entity gets a, 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 a oc or an fc entitlement through a transaction through a related party because that's also something that we can take up after this judgment okay so the first question which was raised in this case before the honorable supreme court was whether the whether the enclat has erred in applying the principle of non discrimination in relation to related party of the corporate debtor and thereby holding against the resolution plan in question for want of provisions for related party no in this case the supreme court said that the uh, factors taken into consideration uh, by the enclat had been in relation to so called discrimination in the resolution plan and it was observed by the supreme court that after taking note of the fact that related party is prohibited to be part of the coc and is further prohibited to be a resolution applicant this is what was held in phoenix arc or an authorized representative the enclat to that extent had rightly observed that the involvement of a related party in cirp in any capacity was seen as giving benefit to the corporate debtor this particular observation of was of enclat was upheld by supreme court so what was upheld by supreme court related party as a separate class related parties not participating into the coc related parties are not participating into as resolution applicant and as authorized representative so these are the things which actually were basically upheld by the honorable supreme court which was also held by enclat now again further the statutory recognition of related party as a different class would apply even to resolution plan when coc would determine whether it's commercial wisdom it should pay related party at all so that is also a kind of discussion no the enclat has erroneously made certain observations about discrimination between related party unsecured financial creditor and other unsecured financial creditor as also between related party operational creditor and other operational creditor the honorable supreme court declined to reconcile with such observation of the appellate tribunal the enclat said that there should be there should not be discrimination in the financial creditors including related party also enclat said that there should not be any discrimination in operational creditor distribution even if they have related parties so this is something which the supreme court denied and they couldn't reconcile the scenario so long as the provisions of the code is concerned any proposition differential payment to different class of creditor in a resolution plan is ultimately subject to the commercial wisdom of the coc no fault can be attached to a resolution plan merely for not making the provision for related party this was very clear that in case the related party is a very very large financial creditor or operational creditor and no provision has been made in the resolution plan for related parties it cannot be considered as a fault in a resolution plan and the resolution plan will get admitted therefore we can't say that there is no provision that the amount can be allocated to related parties amount can also be allocated to related parties amount in case the coc decides or a resolution applicant decide that can also be there some there can be some allocation to related parties by the ra and as approved by the coc so nobody can say that you should not pay to related parties but yes it is not mandatory so it is voluntary it is whose option it is it is the option of the resolution applicant and it is the commercial wisdom of the coc so this part is uh, is it clear uh, ankit so the finally the uh, supreme court held that it was sufficient to observe that the enclat has erred in applying the principles of non discrimination and thereby holding against the resolution plan in question for want of provision of payment of related party so that was very clear that based on this default or this error the resolution plan cannot be rejected so the only only difficulty here that can that can see arising is the provision which says that the coc 
has to or is required to approve a resolution plan which offers at least the um, liquidation value to the creditors payable under section 53. So let's say there's a related party FC and uh, let's assume that that related party FC is a uh, secured creditor, has some security over the uh, some assets of the CD. Now, in that case, if COC and that person, let's say in the COC is not present, he can't vote because that person is a related party. So can we, uh, like, will that person have a right in the COC or a minimum right in the COC based on the idea that he is supposed to get at least a liquidation value? This is where I feel, Ankit, that some allocation can be made to a related party where the related party is a secured creditor. Why I'm saying so, although the related party doesn't have voting, so he cannot uh, reject a resolution plan, but he had a security interest. But that actually, again, it is saying that in case it is approved that a secured related party will have the allocation, then it is giving a benefit to the corporate debtor at the loss of the other financial creditors because for a for a financial for, for a corporate debtor it is very easy to make their related parties as secured creditor so that kind of planning will start happening so therefore even if the related party is unsecured or secured financial creditor or unsecured or secured operational creditor this discrimination in allocation is acceptable and that is considered to be what is the kind of objectives of the code that the benefit of the insolvency should not go to the related parties or to the corporate debtor. That should actually go to the creditors. This is what Ankit, I think. So the extension of that question now is that sometimes it's the money that is getting allocated to an entity because, because you know we have so many cases where there is a kind of group insolvency matters where you know the multiple group entities within the structure or the group structure are into insolvency or are stressed in some manner where let's say a bank x bank has given a loan to uh, a cd and then that cd has further given a loan to another cd and then that cd defaults and there is a secured, uh, uh, you know, claim so of that CD over the other CD. So in that case, you know, the money is not really going uh, at the end of the whole process to any promoter or any company. It is still going to, you know, somebody who uh, lend uh, some maybe a public bank also. Anyways, I think that's an extension. So, uh, okay, I got your point that the CARP, you, you, like the idea and the interpretation of this uh, Supreme Court judgment should be that uh, this uh, whole thought process that the promoters or the CD or the X management should not get any kind of, uh, 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 should not be in a better place uh, is, is supreme over the liquidation value under section 53 to be given to them. Okay. No, but then it is not important that the liquidation value should be given to the related parties. However, in case the company goes into liquidation, then discrimination is not possible. Then in that case, if a particular related party has been admitted as a secured financial creditor and there is an allocation to secured financial creditor, then the discrimination is not permitted. So what we are trying to say that this, this, this uh, discrimination is only in resolution process and in a resolution plan and not in the liquidation because section 53 is very clear. Anyone who is a secured creditor will actually get the priority. Anyone, like in case the liquidation value is available, then it cannot be discriminated. So the basically what we are trying to conclude is that in resolution plan, the related party may be secured, unsecured, operational or financial. The allocation to related parties is voluntary. It is the option of the resolution applicant and also commercial wisdom of the COC to admit it. So in case allocation is done and it is done by RA and it is approved by COC, then nobody can say that there is no provision to allocate some amount to related parties. However, in case the amount is not allocated, that cannot be considered as an error in the resolution plan. So, so the so the promote so the creditors, the COC members rather, who are which does not include the related party, will have an additional incentive to 
maybe get a resolution plan or process or approve a resolution plan because they would know that in case of liquidation uh, maybe there will be some kind of outgo to the uh, un, uh, to the related party as well so absolutely. that would be an added incentive for them absolutely. to go through that absolutely process. because they would the related party would not have a voting share Mm. Whereas in the stakeholders consultation committee, they will have a, a voting share because in liquidation, their voting share, and I think in, in, the, in the stakeholders also, they will not have, sorry, sorry, that I read. In the stakeholders consultation committee also, the related parties will not have their voting share, mm. so, but they will be having the entitlement of distribution of liquidation value if there is anything which is due to them. Because presently, Section 53 does not discriminate between related and unrelated parties as it yeah. is presently. And I think I remember that even in, even in the proposed changes that came up in the discussion paper, there was nothing about related party or unrelated party. It was only about secured versus other creditors. Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, I'm just, uh, trying to find out because see, my uh, laptop uh, is uh, I think uh, I think in the meantime, we can maybe discuss Mr. Sarma, uh, Mr. Srinivasa Sarma. Uh, he had put in a question that was, what if there is a transaction or supply of goods and services to related parties on arm length basis? Uh, I don't think the arm length basis matters. I think if the supply of goods or services has been made before the CRP date, then the person remains a related party and the arm's length basis transactions or not at arm's length basis transactions should not make a difference. Related party transactions are related party transactions. Then uh, Mr. Chatopadhyay, he's asking with reference to EBIC Singapore versus COC of Educom Solutions, can NCLAT return to COC of CD for submission of new resolution plan? Uh, can SC, can NCLAT return to COC of CD for submission of a new resolution plan? Maybe we can have a look at this judgment. Um, I think I've already answered uh, or taken up Anilji's question. And uh, impact of uh, home buyer and related party. So let me try and understand that. Yeah, I think you're audible now. So, in fact, like uh, there was a power failure, so I actually have to join again. So, Ankit, is it okay? The recording is also continuing. Yes, yes, perfectly okay. We we were just taking up a few questions on the question box while, while you were away. So, uh, I, will, I can have a few more questions based on this discussion before we move on to the next uh, case law. So... Um, Hemanji is asking whether claim by a related party or unrelated party beyond limitation period impacting on claim acceptance or rejection by IR, RP, RP. Does it have an impact on the claim acceptance? Uh, limitation is limitation. Whether it, the claim is from related or unrelated, I don't think it, it, there is any differentiation in the timelines with respect to uh, uh, the limitation period in either of the two cases. Yes, I then, think you're yeah. absolutely right. Um, Daita ji is asking if related party payments on arm's length payments are dis disregarded, then if other company gets into CRP, their creditors would lose out. So yeah, but then related party is a related party. I think that's what the Supreme Court judgment is that related parties can have a differential treatment in the in the in the uh, resolution plan that has been passed. Arms length transaction, establishing that or rather not having arms length transactions at all would not make any difference. That's what my interpretation was that I was sharing. No, I think this wording which has been used by Honorable Supreme Court is that in case we allocate some resources to related parties, that actually means giving benefit to corporate debtor. So that's, that that's the observation. Yeah. And even if that. even if even if related party transactions are arm length transactions, when you're treating you know a class of when, when you're treating our related party as related party, arm length or not arm length transactions before CRP date based on which a claim is being filed does not really matter. Related party is related party. Yeah. So Rajesh ji is asking, as uh, uh, told by you for this judgment, we understand that RA is free to include related party for payment without application of section 53 with the approval of the COC in normal circumstances where the related parties will rank equally with parties falls. Yes, so this is what we talked about that uh, related parties will be placed uh, as per section 53 waterfall 
based on their entitlement so uh, if they were not a related party so it would not change anything because section 53 does not differentiate between unrelated and related parties so i think we can move forward and uh, if there are any so further... in this particular judgment which is the appu hotels uh, private limited there is a second issue which is which is crystallized and which is concluded by honorable supreme court because see whenever we try to verify qualification of a resolution applicant under section 29a we come across the clause e of section 29a now clause e of section 29a in case we try to read this it says is disqualified to act as a director under the companies act but this particular clause e is not applicable to connected persons now the basic question i have seen in various rps they have been rejecting the resolution plans they are rejecting resolution applicants because in the data it has been seen that there are companies in which this person is a director and those companies have not filed their financial statements for 3 years some kind of defaults in acceptance of deposit rules some kind of defaults in other rules or other sections of companies act which finally penalizes a director and disqualify the director from the to to act as a director under the companies act so now the supreme court has said that this sections 164 subsection 2 clause b of the companies act it is a reason how the director can be disqualified it may be uh, but as long as as long as the din of that director remains active and compliant on the mca portal it is not the duty of anyone to see what kind of compliances has been done what what kind of compliances has not been done so the supreme court also says it is not automatic disqualification it is not automatic disqualification it is not an assumption that can be taken it is a specific act by the mca to disqualify a director and then make that director as disqualified and will make the din as inactive so <clears throat> unless the din is inactive <clears throat> that means the person is not impacted by this clause e of section 29a so this was also a very large uh, legal struggle while we were giving the uh, eligibility reports on various resolution applicants <clears throat> if the applicant is disqualified to act as a director uh, because see, this section 29a starts with the wording a person shall not be eligible now if a person is not eligible means if a person is not eligible if such person or any other person acting jointly or concert so in case of a joint resolution plan also but i understand is this active din is the final observation and not anything else this is what is this, this is also crystallized by this honorable supreme court i think there will be some questions on this ankit i believe otherwise i'll move on to the next judgment which is vistra itl itcl india limited not so much not so much with respect to the director issue we don't have any questions from the from out in the public so basically what we are saying is that uh, uh, we we have now kind of there is an interpretation now that the law says that disqualified as a director and supreme court has interpreted that the status on the mca should be this to establish that the director is uh, disqualified otherwise he is qualified that's the interpretation right yes. so it's it's it becomes easier for everyone now to check whether a director is disqualified or not so one that is it is saying it is not an assumption that has been taken by the uh, rp or any one who is verifying the eligibility of a resolution applicant and it is not automatic disqualification on non compliance of some of the provisions of companies act 
it, so it makes it, it makes the it makes the life of the rp very easy because earlier we were checking things you know from our end that it was almost like an investigation on whether the director can be disqualified or not now it is very simple that whether mca has disqualified that person as a director or not. absolutely it makes absolutely. things very diff- different now coming to this vistra itcl india limited versus dinkar uh, venkataraman and and uh, as i said the appellant is a security trustee and the respondent in this case uh, like mtech auto limited rp rp of the mtech auto limited is the respondent so therefore the name of the vistra itcl is a uh, security trustee and the uh, security trustee means uh, the uh this basically uh, there is a uh, companies like uh, group companies of mtech auto so i'll just go to the facts so it is a case of mtech auto limited mtech auto limited in fact approached some of the lenders to give a loan of 500 crores and the loan was taken in the group company's name like brasco engineers limited and vld investments private limited this loan was taken in these two companies name and the security and the security was given as the shares of jmt auto limited now jmt auto limited is a company the shares are held by amtrak auto and the loan has been taken to brasco and vld investments against the security of those shares so the owner of the share is amtrak auto shares are in the company called gmt auto limited that doesn't matter because that's an outside scenario however the loan was given to brasco engineers limited only on the security of the shares the owner of shares is the amtrak auto the shares are falling in the financial statements of amtrak auto as the owner of the shares however when this loan was given it was not a case of corporate guarantee corporate guarantee of amtech auto was not given but it only shares which are owned by amtech auto was given as security now think of a situation that the loan has not been given let us consider this vistra itcl although it's a security trustee but vistra itcl is actually working for some person who has given 500 crore so vistra itcl is a security trustee So let's say, like Mr. ITCL is given 500 crore loan. So the loan has been given to Brasco Engineers and VLD Investment. The loan has not been given to Amtech Auto. So when we come to the definition of financial debt, that means this particular Vistra ITCL is not a financial creditor for Amtech Auto. So they submitted their claim and it was rejected by the RP because the RP said that I couldn't find your name. I I couldn't find as a liability in my balance sheet. There is no loan. In my balance sheet, there is no loan. and then you have amtech auto has also not given any corporate guarantee so how can the loan how can the uh, claim be accepted so but it was a first ranking ranking exclusive security and it was for 500 crores so this was also executed in 2015 so then the facts is that there is a special resolution also it was passed uh, to create security over the shares so that means the jm the auto limited also recognized that there is a security creation on the shares of tmt auto so the claim was filed in form c as a as a, as a financial creditor and it was rejected by the rp in 2017 because this is a very old case mtech auto is a very old case and this it was not challenged by the appellants because in 2017 it was rejected however it was not challenged and then two resolution plans were received one was from liberty house and the other was deccan value investors dvi dvi withdraw and finally it was only the liberty house uh, group uh, revised plans were also submitted so all this happened applicant the but then the this vistra filed an application under section 60 uh, claiming the right on the basis of the pledged share so then this particular order was also passed and the so the resolution professional also filed an application before the adjudicating authority now adjudicating authority dismissed the application so this the dismissal order was passed on july 20 and this finally became the subject matter of enclat appeal enclat also dismissed the appeal saying that we can't consider you as a secured financial creditor because that you have not given any loan you are not coming in the definition of financial debt 
the NCLT held that the decision in this regard has not been called in question and the same was not open for the appellant to raise questions in 2020. So NCLAT also said that in 2017, your claim was rejected. Now you are coming in appeal in 2020. That's not acceptable. So they see they observed that this money was not lent to the corporate debtor. Corporate debtor didn't own any financial debt. Therefore, the appellant had not advanced any money to the corporate debtor, so they don't fall into the purview of financial creditor. So therefore, this observation, the appeal was dismissed. Now, Supreme Court, how the Supreme Court dealt with this case? Supreme Court said NCLT as well as the NCLT had not properly appreciated the fact that there is a there is an existing of continuing cause of action. The continuing cause of action is that someone's claim has not been admitted by the RP. And in the IBC, there is no limitation period prescribed for objecting, for objecting to a particular scenario. Now, this was a continuous cause. So first issue was whether this particular appeal can be admitted after about two years of declining, or after about three years. But that was, of course, accepted by the Supreme Court. Then the second question was, like the delay and all this is handled. After the second question, the, the, uh, it's, then the then question came, what exactly uh, is the claim? So it, this is, uh, since so far it is going on on the same subject, whether this kind of claim can be admitted at by so much of distance or not. Then this issue was first decided that there is no problem. It is a continuous cause of action. The appellant could not qualify to be a financial creditor of the corporate debtor. It is submitted that there is only a third party security given in the form of pledged shares with respect to the amounts advanced by the appellant to affiliate companies. Thus, the appellant cannot be considered as a financial creditor of the corporate debtor. This was also the arguments made by the uh, respondent. The case of Anuj Jain. Uh, in the case of uh, Jayaprakash, uh, uh, JP, JP, Jayaprakash Associates Limited, that was also uh, used, uh, where the holding company of the uh, JP Infratech Limited, in fact, uh, gave a mortgage of various land parcels to the creditors. And that particular case was also used, and it was held in that case that a person only having a security interest in the assets of the corporate debtor, even if falling in the description of secured creditor by virtue of collateral security extended by the corporate debtor, would nevertheless stand outside the sect of the financial creditor. So it was held in that case when the large parcel of the land was given to JAL. And in that particular large parcel, the loan was not given. So they actually couldn't become financial creditor. So Phoenix also, in this case of Phoenix, it was held that the pledge agreement was in respect of 40,000 shares, which were pledged to l and as a security, thereby restricting the liability of the CDL, but this cannot constitute financial debt. So it was also held that this cannot be... So there are two judgments which was against them. One was the Phoenix and the other was the Anuj Jain case in the case of Jill and Jal. Now, the, in this case, finally, the observations of the Supreme Court was is very, very important. See, the Supreme Court says that uh, the appellant to be treated as a secured creditor, but would not fall under the category of financial or operational. Supreme Court says that the this Vistara, Vistara is a secured creditor. And Supreme Court says that the definition of the security interest we have seen, any asset which A secured creditor in the CIRP of in the CIRP of the owner of that asset. Now, Mtech Atto is the owner of shares. Mtech Atto has allowed somebody else to take loan on these shares. The asset of the Mtech Auto is actually as is lying as a security with some other lender. That lender has not given any loan to the company and has not supplied any goods or services. Therefore, that particular lender is not a financial creditor, not an operational creditor. The Supreme Court has said, in terms of the decisions in the Anuj and Phoenix, 
the appellant wants to be treated as secured creditor but would not fall under the category of financial creditor or operational creditor. Therefore, the appellant would be denied the benefit of amendments to section 30 subsection 2. No, when we saw the benefit of section 30 subsection 2, then we saw that what exactly Supreme Court is trying to say, what was the amendment in section 30 subsection 2? It was the section 30 subsection 2, the resolution professional shall examine a resolution plan received by him to confirm that each resolution plan provides for the resolution process cost, also provides for the payment of operational creditor in such manner as may be specified above, which shall not be less than this amount and this amount, and also and also for the uh, secured uh, uh, creditor. Uh, so this is where the dissenting creditors and interests were being uh, project, uh, protected. So this particular amendment was also brought in. Consequently, a very odd and peculiar situation was deemed to be created where a secured creditor was denied the benefit of the security interest. The right to exercise the sale of secured interest yet not be treated as either a financial creditor or as an operational creditor. Now, there is a right on a particular person to exercise the sale of the secured asset. Now, the observations of the Supreme Court went ahead and says that in terms of Section 52 of the Code, a secured creditor in liquidation proceeding has a right to relinquish its security interest to the liquidation estate and receive proceeds. See, the, the, the creditor has a second option to um, proceed under Section 52 and realize its security interest in itself by selling. So, the amended intent of Section 30, subsection 2, read with Section 31 of the code is contrary since it recognizes and protects the interest of other creditors who are outside the purview of the COC. Now, finally, the Supreme Court says, answer to this problem could be to treat the secured creditor as a financial creditor of the corporate debtor to the extent of the estimated value of the pledged share. Then Supreme Court said that this will make them a member of the committee of creditor and give it voting rights equivalent to the estimated value of the pledged shares. However, this may require reconsideration of the dictum and the ratio of Anujan and the Phoenix ARC. Then the second option was given by the Supreme Court because the first option was not feasible because that actually will change the entire uh, uh, IPC process. Second option is to treat the appellant as a secured creditor who will be entitled to retain the security interest in the pledged share and in terms thereof would be entitled to retain the security proceeds on the sale of the said pledged shares. The second recourse available would be almost equivalent in monetary terms for the appellant. So this is what finally decided and finally the Supreme Court said that the appellant would be treated as secured creditor who would be entitled to all rights and obligations as applicable to a secured creditor in terms of section 52 and 53 of the code in accordance with the pledge agreement, which was dated 5th of July 2016. So okay, in this manner, the Supreme Court first considered that in case we make uh, this party a secured financial creditor, then they would participate into the COC. This will completely disturb the entire, uh, they, this will completely disturb the Anuj Jain case and Phoenix ARC case. So they said the second option is that we make them secured creditor. Now, in future, if there is any secured credit, that doesn't mean that he's a part of the financial, he is part of the COC. So this is what was held by the Supreme Court. So in fact, we have finished uh, today's uh, deliberation on these two judgments. Let's see if there are some questions on, on, on uh, today's deliberations. So now like this, this judgment, and okay, I think we need to differentiate this judgment because this judgment came in at a time when this process with respect to this this CD was way, way through and there was a lot of time that was elapsed. So perhaps that is the reason why the first option could not have been exercised and that ratio that has uh, Supreme Court's ascent in Anujan and Phoenix ARC, they also talked about that. So what do we do when this kind of a claim comes in where somebody has <clears throat> a security interest over an asset of the CD but has not lent to the company directly. I can talk about 
home buyers where home buyers have taken funding from uh, but that will be a case of guarantee where the company has so the given a guarantee actually, they give their check to the company only you know? They, yeah, so that, that's case, a, but, no check came to the company, no funds was uh, coming to the bank account of the company. Yes, guarantee comes into place here. I don't think a guarantee was also in place, or there that is no been, corporate guarantee. But corporate guarantee, but there was only and only a security interest. In other cases where a financial creditor has a has a, or a creditor has a guarantee with the company, then again they get a status through that gar- holding that guarantee. Yes. So uh, will this give rise to a new? class of creditors where somebody can have a security interest over a company's asset and not have any mm-hmm. uh, not be a creditor and be a secured creditor for the purpose of the resolution plan and still yes, not participate till now we have seen a secured financial creditor then also we saw the secured operational creditor in rainbow paper and now we have seen the secured creditor which is a third class of secure uh, security interest so the secured financial creditor was earlier there. Secured financial creditors came later because Section 53, Section 53, in case we try to uh, see, uh, that's also very important that we should try to see what exactly Section 53 says. So section- we can also yeah we can also have a look at 31 that was talked about by Supreme Court that is contrary to you know the 53 part. I think that was also talked about briefly in that judgment. I mean, but then Section 53 very clearly says that debt owed to a secured creditor in the event such secured creditor has relinquished security interest in the manner set out in Section 52. So mm. what I'm trying to say is that in IBC Section 53 doesn't talk about the allocation to secured financial creditor or to secured operational creditor, but the only thing that they have said is the secured creditor. So the Supreme Court was aware of this particular word. See the why this uh, word actually has been not used as a secured financial creditor. That's very careful. I think uh, this is uh, really commendable that it was seen that there may be various circumstances where the secured creditor can be operational, can be financial, or can be a third party, third category. So, so, in, the claim, so in the claim admittance process, now there can be, you know, different classes. Of course, there are there, there are workmen, there are other classes, but then yes, that has to be identified, differentiated, and also related they, parties. Uh, related, unrelated have to be differentiated. And, and now also as a related party. I was also saying that. Also as a related. That's also a class of creditor. The class, then that's a differentiation. Then there is also secured creditors who may not be operational or financial creditors. Yes. So uh, that's the I think now another uh, class that needs to be taken up. I so, think that all that we wanted to say today, these two important judgments, in fact, have resolved uh, various issues, which in fact most of the stakeholders, insolvency professionals. Uh, members of the committee, they were finding this difficult as answers. So we have got the answers of these three things today. Eligibility under Section 29, sub clause E. Secondly, the uh, whether the related parties are entitled to a distribution or not in a resolution plan. Number three, there is a third class which is considered a secured creditor. The person who has not given any corporate guarantee is not given any loan. But if any of the asset of the company is a security interest with somebody else, that person will be considered as a security, a secured creditor. So these are the three things that these two judgments have concluded. We thought it is very important that bring it to light to our, all our uh, listeners and uh, viewers. So this was the objective. Uh, so we conclude uh, today's webinar. I can take a few more questions. So Priyanka Narangi is asking, and secure creditor shall participate in COC meeting? No, no, I don't think there is any provision for, uh, because they're neither operational creditors nor financial creditors. So they would not have any participating right. If Absolutely. there is a COC which does not have any financial creditors, then also there will be no entitlement because then also the, only the OCs would have constitute only the COC. OCs will have the committee formation. So there is no provision for any other creditor to be part of the COC meeting. Arun Kumar ji is saying, what is the hierarchy of secured creditors who are neither financial creditors or operational creditors who opt to relinquish their security? In the liquidation scenario in section 53, they have a ranking. They have the same priority as to secured financial creditors. And in case of a CIRP process, uh, they would have that provision helping them, which says that uh, uh, the value which somebody they, can... But, but they, they would not become a dissenting financial creditor because if dissenting is only a person who has a voting share. 
so they would not get anyway some anything in the crp process so in another reason CIRP for process, others in the crp process they, they see they can only say that our security which has been mortgaged to us should be kept away or it should be uh, like uh, that security uh, should be reserved for us but then on what ground because if the rest of the coc is voting because their passes. claim would be admitted as secured creditor so if the claim is admitted yes, as a sir. secured creditor there is nothing in the crp regulations which requires them to be paid because the rule that says that the resolution plan is uh, is supposed to have the liquidation value allocated to the uh, financial creditors is uh, or uh, rather uh, dissenting financial creditors is a different rule so that means that any person who has a, a security interest on any of the assets of the corporate debtor that asset must be excluded from the resolution process from the resolution plan that's what is the meaning of this particular judgment if on any asset if there is a security interest of any person and that person is not coc member then that particular asset should be considered outside the resolution plan or but only then, that part should be considered which will come back to the company if the, so value, is, if, so if, the resolution, if the resolution plan is approved or presented by an ra and the security is waived or rather a very small amount is given to the secured creditor as compared to the amount of the security interest then again that will be subject to uh, some kind of litigation that the security interest is say valued at 100 crore but i'm being given only 1 crore so what that there is will be there is because the supreme court has said that the value of that security should be kept aside Hmm. That is also, uh, that's very clearly said by the Supreme Court that the value of this security hmm. and uh, yes, hmm. almost equal, equivalent to the monetary terms for the appellant. So now uh, would practically... Be, would be, no, it is said that the would be entitled to retain the security proceeds on the sale of the said pledged share, would be entitled to. So in that case, uh, whenever this plan was passed, Today, this asset, which is still in, uh, still with uh, Amtec Auto, would now be uh, required to be realized and paid to the financial creditor, uh, to the yes. uh, to the secured yes, creditor yes. today. So it becomes an additional Absolutely. burden on the resolution applicant. Because this is very clearly said that would be entitled to retain the security proceeds on the sale of the pledged shares. So but effectively, this is an additional burden on the RA today. Yes, yes, yes. The RA's assets have reduced effectively yeah yeah okay so uh okay so uh, all right so i think other than this uh i'm just looking at the question and seeing if there's a different question um i think not but we can conclude uh, uh right then i think uh, let's conclude thank you everyone thank you so thank much you, and uh, looking forward to see you next week thank you thank you